mother. I have to have faith for this to work on me, Mr. Vincent. If giants existed in the remote past, then Genesis 6-4 read there were giants in the earth in those days. They must have had customs of their own that included religious practices and traditions, well worth knowing. Had they not been lost forever? Well, maybe not forever. Prehistory tells us all about the extinction of the dinosaurs and the unforeseen rise of brute man the troglodyte, the Neanderthal, the cro and then Homo sapien. The prehistoric record, like the Akashic record, offers evidence of much more than that. Records of giant beings and giant earthquakes, universal deluges, stupendous volcanic explosions incredible conflagration, and tremendous meteoric impacts. These were celestial. These were terrestrial and celestial events of planet-encircling magnitude, all outlined in the psychological records of mankind. The individual subconscious, or the collective unconscious, if there were humanoid creatures to witness such events as end extinctions, they must have been traumatic in the extreme. The suggestion is that events of apocalyptic dimensions result in racial trauma 
cultural amnesia, an individual denial, post-traumatic disorder brought about by apocalypses. I could imagine it would just be beyond maddening. There are rich, reoccurring individual references in fringe, ancient, and occult literatures to civilizations <laughs> interior to our own. These civilizations are generally described as seafaring societies with high degree of technological expertise that in some fields surpassed our own as well as fit in the psychic attainments that beggar the imagination. I thought it said bugger the imagination. Shambhala, Mu, Lemuria, Atlantis, Avalon, Arcadia, Nuremberg. Their names resonate with the spirit and energy of poetry, with the cultures and societies that flowered in the distant past and then disappeared seemingly beneath the waters of the world. Fauna and flora, edifices and animals and early human beings seemingly without leaving a trace. Like Debussy's sunken cathedral, the islet of Mount St. Michael, the Menhirs of Karnak, they resonate in the human imagination. They are like dreams come true. Here we enter the realm of dreams. Did not Plato describe art as dreams for the waking mind? Canvas of the earliest days of Earth is in the dream screen of the psychoanalyst, and describing it might be what is called true dreaming or dreaming true. Dreams beget speculation, and speculation begets theories which may or may not have an air of certainty about them. There is a heritage of speculation, semi-scientific, quasi-scientific, about the face of early Earth, this is the providence of the independent thinker, who plays in modern times the role of the savant or bard of old, the custodian of tradition, who entertains his fellow human being with the tribal lays. In our time, their tales shine with the veneer of science. One of the most influential independent thinkers of the modern period is Hans Horbiger. 1816 to 1931. The Austrian mining engineer who proposed his once popular cosmic ice theory, Horbiger undertook his work in earnest. He regarded himself as a genius, or at least he regarded her, his findings as the work of genius. Indeed, he had no false modesty, having once boasted that he knew he was right when I knew that Newton was wrong. In 1913, he advanced his theory of the frozen cosmos to the German publication of Gesalkomogony, written in collaboration with Philip Fawthen. His book was widely reprinted, though curiously, it never appeared in an English translation. There are two reasons why his work is of present-day interest. First, his philosophy is an instance of a theory contrary to fact, like the flat earth theory or the hollow earth theory. Second, it is an example of the occult thought that attracted the interest of the Nazi theoreticians and ideologues, especially Heinrich Himmler, who on behalf of the Third Reich incorporated the cosmic ice theory into Aryan science. For these reasons, its influence was initially limited to the German-speaking world. Indeed, the English-speaking world kept the cosmic ice theory at arm's length. In post-war years, it attracted the interest of a handful of dissident thinkers in England, and their interest sparked that of Seurat, who in turn kindled an interest in these ideas among the French reading public. All in all, Surratt was the most respectable and the most prominent spokesman for such thought in any language, and they only won with an independent reputation as a writer and educator. Now, scanning down further on here, I noticed he's got uh, this written, and you can easily, uh, I'm thinking along the lines of Saturn theory, 
But um, Horbiger is the guy who's got the successive moons crashing into the Earth. His glacial cosmology. Apparently he must have been a German. And, you know. But uh, this is a pretty good little read here. This presents a new development, stimulating and provocative, of the theories advanced in a well-known series of books by H.S. Bellamy and Peter Allen. Like Mr. Bellamy and Mr. Allen, Professor Surratt accepts the glacial cosmology of Horbiger. Its theories of successive satellites crashing into the Earth, or crashing to the Earth, and subsequent global cataclysms. In these events, Professor Surratt argues, are to be found not only the origins of some of our major myths, Atlantis, for example, but also an explanation of certain puzzling anthropological remains of superhuman size. Can, can it have been, he asks, the gravitation pull of our tertiary satellite induced both gigantism and longevity? If so, what happened after the subsequent catastrophe? During a golden age, can ordinary men have walked the earth under the benevolent tutelage of good giants? And did these good giants degenerate into the ogres of legend? The answers suggested by Professor Seurat created wide interest when the book was first published in France. I read it, wrote M. Jean Cocteau, with much more than my eyes alone. In this country, too, where Professor Seurat's work is almost equally well known, Atlantis and the Giants will be recognized as a notable contribution to Horbiggerian lit literature. In one of Horbigger's books, I do believe he's got live fish falling from the sky, and lo and behold, it even happens to this day. Apparently, in these spouts that we call tornadoes, but they call typhoons, is it? Something like that. No, a typhoon is a is a hurricane. Uh, what's it called? What's it called? Oh my god, I can't believe I can't remember. Oh, they're called uh, suction cup? No. <sighs> Professor Surratt is a daring thinker, impatient of provisional conclusions. All his books from the philosophical dialogues written when he was a young man, to that very remarkable book founded on personal experience, The End of Fear, show the same exciting quality in his latest volume, which has created wide interest in France. He develops the glacial cosmology of the Austrian scientist Horbiger and his followers, Mr. H. S. Bellamy and Peter Allen. His theory replaces the picture of a slow and humdrum evolution of the Earth by a violent and cataclysmic one. It describes terrestrial ages in which three moons in succession revolve so close to the Earth that, to quote Professor Surratt, they outshone the Sun, being very much larger, and later circled the Earth several times a day. Well, now you know we could just replace those moons for planets. Because, like the moon said, they're going to have an uplifting effect on the Earth. All of a sudden, everything's going to be a lot lighter. People are going to grow a lot bigger. Animals. And later crashed on the Earth and destroyed all nations. The attraction exerted by these moons was so great that it gathered the waters of the earth into a great bulge around the equator. That would be the absolute, I would imagine. Professor Surratt believes, Professor Surratt believes that they brought two golden ages to mankind. For he holds that man was not born until toward the last phase of the second moon. Perhaps 15 million years ago, perhaps 15 million years ago, during the first and the second golden age, high civilizations existed. 
fostered by benevolent moons. So this would be our third time around. I've heard that before. Then the moon crashed and the piled up waters at the equator poured north and south, inundating, inundating islands and continents. Continents. It was on an earth left by the territory catastrophe that our own modestly attractive moon rose. Horbiger's theory of glacial cosmology is not officially accepted by scientists. Yet the Horbigerian theory does seem to give a reasonable explanation for more things than the official one. For instance, the gigantic plants and the huge fossilized animals. Professor Surratt points out that an orgasm plant, an organism plant or animal buried normally today does not fossilize. It rots away. Fossils must have been formed by extraordinary pressures, such, perhaps, as the crash of a moon. And there are the stories, records, Professor Surratt would call them, of a giant race. He believes that the giants really existed, and he has an ingenious explanation for them. When those earlier moons circled close to the Earth, the gravitation exerted by them lessened the weight of all creatures, drawing them upward. Living things grew taller, and the giant race was born when the moon crashed. Professor Surratt believes that some of the giants escaped and later became the teachers of their high civilization to ordinary mankind. They lived to fabulous ages. In Greece, long after their death, they became gods or titans. But on giants, Professor Surratt relies mostly on the Bible, for there are the described objectively, without any theological coloring, since Jehovah, the one true God, could not admit companions or rivals. The Horbigerian theory does provide a possible explanation for the appearance of giants and the creation of man. The atmospheric conditions, let us say, on the other hand, a golden age when men were taught and ruled by wise giants is perhaps nothing more than a pleasing imagination. <laughs>